My name is Moira Samuels. I live 300 metres from Grenfell Tower and I watched the fire on the night. I've lived in the community for over 30 years. I became involved in the campaign about a week after the fire and I have since then been a spokesperson and co-coordinator for the campaign. This is Future Heist, conversations with people making change. My name is Rena Neve Smith. Grenfell was obviously a massive atrocity. It was the worst fire that London had seen for a very long time. And it seemed like it ripped through the heart of the community. As somebody who's lived in the area for, for a while, how would you say that it impacted the community? Well, I think it was shocking for many people. I think because so many of us watched the fire on the night and I think those images live with you forever and actually cause quite a lot of trauma. But then I think actually the additional trauma was the sense of abandonment that the community had in immediately after that because the survivors were kind of left to on their own with nowhere to go, nowhere to sleep. Um, the bereaved families actually were running around from hospital to hospital trying to find their missing family members. They didn't seem to be in the immediate aftermath, um, you know, a coordinated civil contingencies response. Um, that happened alongside, ironically, with a huge swathe of donations and support that came from both within the community and outside of the community. So we had this double thing going on, which was quite contradictory because at the same time, there was an enormous feeling that we were reaching out to help without any uh, support from the authorities. At the same time, it was quite shocking. Um, actually, that sense of who's in charge. We had no sense of actual, you know, that there was any civil um, authorities that were there to help us um, and that took a long time I think for the community to get over. Mm. Was there any point when you did <clears throat> feel like there was a sense of responsibility taken on by those in charge? I think that happened about a week into after the fire where the Red Cross came in, the borough actually started to work with the Red Cross we know that people were housed in the Westway Sports Centre for a while, in the actual sports hall, they was, people were sleeping there. Um, so yes, that began to sort of... But at the same time, we were still doing an enormous amount. We were directing survivors to where they could find help or support, clothes, food. We were trying to establish where vouchers had been allocated to, so they can actually purchase the food or clothes. We were just trying to manage people's grief and where they were frantically trying to find missing relatives. You know, a lot of us were all just doing and helping with the donations. So it took a long while for, I think I would argue probably weeks before a gold command, what they called gold command um, recovery was sent in. And that was a, uh, Across individuals from different boroughs, the government set up a task force who actually was then in charge. And um, that's when the community thought, okay, there is a body mm -hmm. that is there. Mm -hmm. So Theresa May, um, immediately after, wanted to set up an, an inquiry into what happened at Grenfell. The families wanted to have a panel involved, but they were told they couldn't have that because it would delay the proceedings. However, um, we've had the first phase of the inquiry. The second phase now is not due to start until late 2019, even early 2020. And uh, the companies involved, uh, like Ryden, the contractors, or Arconic, who made the cladding, they seem to be holding things up and not submitting evidence. And there's a sense that the companies responsible are holding back for fear probably that they'll get blamed for what happened. My sister works in, in as a civil engineer and what I know from the construction industry that there's a lot of regulations that aren't respected, there's a lot of corners that get cut 
Um, do you think that what happened at Grenfell exposes the problems of capitalism and the problems of when construction and buildings are maintained in order to make profits rather than uh, to look after the people involved? Mm -hmm. I think it was interesting that um, at the last, at the closing statements of the inquiry, that um, I think one of the QCs referred to a, a lack of um, institutional candour and actually identifying that actually if, we can, if change is going to happen, that's what we need. We need truth and responsibility. Um, so yes, the delay, um, you know, does seem to indicate that it's going to allow space for the corporates some who just presented written evidence and didn't come and give oral evidence um, to actually get their story straight. And it's clear from the Oconic Q, uh, legal representative that they feel not only just that they needed just a fire extinguisher, then it wouldn't have spread, but also that basically Celotex, who installed the insulation, they probably more implicated, or that a combination of um, you know, um, insulation interacting with the cladding was responsible. Um, so we know from Grenfell that actually there were so many, um, the building, there were so many deficits, you know, the building was a death trap in all sorts of ways, you know, and starting from the need for the cladding in the first place, clearly the, the, in a high rise you need insulation but the cladding was there to actually, for aesthetic reasons, because of a change in demographic that actually talked to the history of social cleansing that's been going on in the area. Um, and then putting the cladding on the building and trying to save, putting a combustible cladding on the building to save 300,000, you know, tells you that, act, that the drive was for cost cutting rather than safety and this is people in in residential high rises where you know it's been identified that the cladding was equivalent to wrapping the building in 30,000 liters of petrol so you know if you that's what you're driven by actually people's safety is not important where you had um you know, ride and the company putting in the windows where there were gaps and they weren't, you know, they acted as chimneys for the fire, all sorts of issues around the active and passive protection, um, safety protection within the building that actually had been breached, you know, the lifts weren't working for the, the dry riser wasn't working, there was low pressure on the water, the fire doors in the flats actually didn't, couldn't last the expected amount of time in the case of the fire. Um, you know, we could go on and on and on about the breaches, that that building was a death trap, really. And as Barbara Lane said, people should not have been living in that building. And so you do have to ask yourself, how come this has been allowed to happen, you know, and obviously privatization, outsourcing, cost cutting, making it easy for property developers, companies to actually make money was at the heart of this rather than the resident safety. Of course. <clears throat> and the outrage at the minute, there is a sense of outrage now because of all these delays, there's what that means is that there's presumably other buildings around the country where people are also living. So it, it, it's not just about what happened to Grenfell, you know, in 2017. It's also about the present moment. It's about these things waiting to happen again. Mm, I think the question of um, the cladding and the banning of the cladding and the removal of cladding has implications for the whole country. and. A, in particular has implications for people, for um, council tenants, um, schools, university, you know, residents, student residents. And so actually it's, it's a very, very important issue. Um, but the government has again been done a lot of smoke and mirrors. You know, we will give you 400 million to actually have the cladding removed. Well, actually that's not enough. If you look at the number of buildings, you know, it has been identified as nearly 500 um, buildings and somebody identified, I think in Portsmouth that 
um, it would cost 13 million just to remove it off one building. So, you know, we can do the maths, it's just not enough. Also, they're telling the local authority now to where's private um, residents that have the cladding, private um, buildings, that um, the local authority has the, uh, the right to go in and remove the cladding themselves. I'm sorry, I don't trust our local authority here to do any of that. You know, and they're not addressing the needs of the community at the moment, let alone going to take cladding off other buildings. So, you know, the whole thing has become a complete and utter mess and is making people, not just from Grenfell, right across the country, incredibly insecure um, about their living conditions. The Grenfell fire happened around the time of a general election. Um, a lot of the people who were affected, um, people who died and, and, and families who survived, uh, were refugees and migrants. It's a very diverse community around here. And um, it felt at the time like it was really a symbol of a lot of things that are wrong right now. It felt like it was a symbol of austerity um, for reasons we've just talked about. And also uh, racism and even imperialism where you have people coming to Britain for a better life and then just being treated with utter contempt um, by those in charge. However, the way that news is reported means that there was a lot of um, reports about it at the time, obviously, and a lot of discussion and a lot of attention. But then the way the news works is things move on and other issues get talked about. And how difficult has it been to keep the campaign going and keep talking about this when, when it is so hard to, to do that? Mm. I think that actually we've been lucky to have quite a lot of media contacts which we developed all throughout the life of the campaign um, but we are very dependent sometimes on the media contacting us when issues come up so we try to do press um, releases, we try to put up articles, we try to actually include on our website um, and tweets and all our social media platforms issues directly things that are happening within the community and actually um, news items that actually relate not just to Grenfell but that you know have implications for everything other other buildings and communities right across the country so that's the way we try and we try and keep it but it's it's, it's absolutely true we're very worried and concerned that actually with Brexit that actually the question of Grenfell is going to go very very low down you know, um, on the agenda, um, and also that, as I said before, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors, that things are promised, but when you look at the finer detail, like the removing and the banning of cladding, um, it's, it was only on new buildings for the future. You know, so it looks like a, a, a grand gesture, but it actually isn't. So then we have the issue of what's happening to the other buildings. So a lot of we having to actually expose some of these things and respond to them, um, which is quite quite hard work, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and at the minute, it just, um, like Brexit's been all over the news mm. for like a long time and seems to be an ongoing thing. And a lot of it seems like speculation anyway. It's, um, you know, it, and, and a lot of, there's so many issues that have been kind of pushed away from the, mm. from the foreground. Um, it's the Grenfell tragedy has made me think a lot about the way news is reported. And again, newspapers are sold for profit, aren't they? Mm. It's not necessarily about informing people, mm. it's about creating a story. And, um, and so, and, and I, th I feel like that's why people get kind of saturated with one issue at a time mm -hmm. and then there's a sense of like moving on and mm -hmm. um, so it must be incredibly difficult to to keep things going and and I feel like all that the institutional indifference is then maintained because because without public um, outrage or without a sense that people are watching what they're doing then then those in charge can sort of get away with a bit more. Mm, I think the difference is the local community is very aware um, and we, we've been so inundated with the media that we had to tell them to go away because we need, people need 
space and time to grieve mm -hmm. and also we were very wary about how they we wanted to tell our own story and that's what's become um, you know the narrative for the community we can tell our own story there are things going on within the community where we now need to get organized where we are getting organized but we don't necessarily feel at the stage we need to tell the media about that you know um, we need to think about what the future because phase two is going to be much more political it's looking at what happened before the fire and what happened after and that means that as a community we need to start actually thinking about how we're going to respond to that but also you know what changes is going to happen between now and phase two that's what we need to focus on the changes that have the the issues that have been identified in phase one we want to see things implemented and that means making sure that it's certainly for this community um, those things are happening and in some cases we don't need to inform the media the only time we do need to is for example to challenge so in like in the case of the effigy we had to actually get up there and and sort of say something about something as abominable as that um, yeah the effigy that was put on a bonfire mm. and, um, of, of, the of the tower you know we we had to respond to that because it was a racist and b abs absolutely awful to think that you can mock the deaths of people but i think we have um local social media groups that we use we use our own platforms um and we hopefully or get him out across the yeah. country. Yeah. That's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that. And I guess it's for you as well, it's um it's going from a short term response to actually the the disaster when it happened and then going into a more long term strategy. What mm. kind of things have you been have you been working on in terms of going forward? Well, going forward, we have to address, there are a couple of key areas within the community that has to be addressed. One is mental health and the enormous deficits and those are, those have to be tracked and those have to be actually documented so that we can, you know, and but they have to be responded to um, as well. Um, we know that actually there's, there's an uneven provision of mental health. <clears throat> Also, we need to respond to the question of social housing because that's still ongoing. A lot of the survivors have only been placed in temporary accommodation. When are they going to get permanent homes? We're talking it's 18 months. So that, by focusing on, on the question of social housing, we also need to look at the needs of the whole community. But also, this is a national crisis. So, that, you know, linking in with other groups and thinking about how we change that and the kind of demands we can make of local authority and central government. Um, we need to be, we are thinking about actually how the opposition party if they were to get into government, if there was to be an election, what are they going to say about Grenfell? How is that going to be included in the manifesto? And we want to see something in their manifesto about Grenfell because it's been such a significant issue for not just our community, but the whole country. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we need to be thinking how we change the narrative around privatization and outsourcing really and that's quite quite a hard that is directly challenging neoliberalism at the moment so it's doing that in some kind of small way um, you know trying to get the housing services back in house and those kind of issues which also can sound quite boring but other but these, those key issues, how do we change that? But also, just also getting our community to feel confident enough, if you're residents, to challenge. You know, that's really, so we do a lot of support stuff. Um, people know we're here, if, if the, you know, information. Because I think at the end of the day, residents really need to take up, you know, um, questions of the quality of the, 
the space, the home they're living in, so that it's decent and it's safe, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You grew up in South Africa, mm-hmm. um, how, and under apartheid. Mm-hmm. How has your experience personally kind of informed what you do, both with this campaign and also more widely as an activist? It's, it's you know, I can't make direct analogies, but obviously, after the fire, you can sniff, I don't know, it's just in my DNA, I can sniff injustice and inequality. And there were so many examples where I felt actually the only reason that you're not responding to people's needs is because of their race or their actual background, the fact that they're Muslim or that some of the tenants are social, you know, poor, poorer community, members of our community. Um, and that, you know, I had that experience of where politics and decision making at both local and national level impact directly on your lives, your everyday life, the school you go to, the job you get, where you buy your food, everything. And I think that actually with Grenfell, um, that came home to us as a community, that actually all these decisions that have been made actually meant that people lived or died. And so I could use my experience of South Africa, how we responded to that, um, you know, that living experience. I could use that um, in a sense. And also just to have been an activist, you know, I'd been an activist in the area before the fire. Um, there's a long tradition and history in the area of fighting against institutional racism, um, of actually, you know, the carnival. We have a long tradition um, that we can actually, you know, tap into. And with the change in demographic, we were starting to, in the years before Grenfell, at least two years before Grenfell, we were really starting to feel the impact of gentrification and having to fight it. And also I was part of the Stand Up to Racism group in the area because, you know, we have a large Moroccan community and there was a lot of actually negative reportage in the media about how many ISIS recruits came from the area. So there was, a, you know, we were, we were fighting on a lot of other fronts. Um, And I think that having to directly challenge as an an activist, you know, saying, look, we have to either take to the streets, we have to go to where the power is based, we need to go to town hall and intervene in meetings, that kind of helped um, to give me the confidence and to, for the community to feel that, yes, this, this is the right thing to do. We all have to do it, you know, and now lots and lots of people go to council meetings and ask questions. Um, and that's before that people just felt like they do it to us. We've got no ability to influence this. I think that that's kind of changed. Um, how, you know, how we think of ourselves as community members. I think that, does that answer yeah, your question? Yeah, no, absolutely, it does. That's, that's really interesting. And I'm wondering as well, what was your journey into politics pers- personally and, and, and into activism? Is it something that was always an interest for you? Or is it... I think it's just the experience of apartheid. Mm-hmm. You know, if you grow up in a, in, in a society where, A, you feel powerless, B, it's incredibly violent, and I hated the violence. I hated the fact that my teachers could beat me, that everyone could beat me. The, the fact that there was just non-stop on the bus there was violence. I hated that, that it was so endemic. Um, that actually the inequality was shocking. You know, the levels of wealth of white society relative to the levels of poverty was absolutely breathtaking. And you just thought, even as a child, this is wrong. This is wrong. This should not um, be happening. Um, And just my personal experience of being thrown out of buses, thrown out of restaurants, threatened with arrest, having police with guns at your head, um, you know, fighting part of campaigns in South Africa. um, And... You know, being a student, student activist, I think um, 
I just decided that I couldn't just accept it. I had to try and do something about it and join with others to actually do something about it to change. Um, and we were all swept up, my generation, with the civil rights movement and, um, you know, the black consciousness movement. So that's the kind of political trajectory, you know. By the time I was an active student um, member, the ANC was banned, the South African Communist Party was banned. Um, so, you know, we were all kind of supporters of those groups, you know, partly because anything South Africa banned. We knew it had to be good. <laughs> you know, so it's... And I think it's just also a tradition of my, in my family because my family, before they came here, I, I had my father's siblings left South Africa in, in the 60s and they were part of the sit-ins that they had, um, which was influenced by the Americans going into a white-only restaurant and just sitting here and refusing to leave and then they got arrested and stuff like that and then they left so um, you know just finding out the history of why they left and just being part of the group areas act as well you know when we lost our home in Cape Town because they declared the area where we were living in white so we had to leave um, you know that the kind of upheaval of all of that I think it's just influenced um, my sense of injustice and inequality and I think also the role of the trade unions actually really influenced me as a student because you know you're very heady as a student you think oh I can change the world and, blah, blah, blah. and but you realize that actually where the power lies you know and the level of strikes you know I think South Africa had the world's highest strikes you know, consistently, strikes, protests, stay aways, every tactic, because workers realised that where the power lied, if they actually withdrew their labour, they could actually start bringing companies, putting pressure on companies to actually change, you know, um, and start negotiating. Um, and so I think I was really impressed by that power and so you know here with the campaign we work with the unions quite a lot we have a lot of union support trade union support um because we realize that actually that alliance um gives us wind in our sails you know gives us support they can disseminate stuff to their members um you know we can get information and knowledge that we may not have ourselves. The, we were talking just before about the effect of neo, neoliberalism and um, austerity and how Grenfell really can be seen as a symbol of that, as a, as a result of that, as a direct result of that. And talking about the trade unions there, the trade union power in this country was really taken on in the years of Thatcher um, by neoliberal politicians and thinking about how, how instrumental they can be in, in organising collective power. Mm. Um, and how it seems like it's no coincidence that their power was really taken on um, mm. in that time. It's really important, isn't it, for, for communities to organise and for campaigns like Justice for Grenfell to link people together in order to, in order to have a collective voice. Yes, and I think also, given that you identified that period of Thatcher, you know, breaking the miners, that had historical implications um, because we talk whatever 20 years on and I think we have a generation who don't understand why unions are important so actually for the campaign as well for a legacy of a younger generation that may be outraged and want to do something about we often say look you need to join a union um, uh, because I think that tradition has been lost somewhat. Um, but also because we need to see, it's, it's obvious to us, so for example in housing, it's obvious to us that housing workers have not been able to fight single-handedly against the attacks on social housing, on you know, council housing. And actually, a bit like in schools, 
where teachers have been saying, look, we can't have these tests. It's not right for children to be treated as scores and, then, you know, tests, constant test factories. Um, once they had parents supporting them, their fight got much stronger. So for, for the, you know, housing workers, if you have the communities you're serving on board who will come and stand and support you, then your fight is much stronger because it's the, the workers and the service you know, users, service providers and service users coming together and actually your hand is a lot more stronger. And it means that it actually shapes what the unions stand for, actually. What are you fighting for? Um, yes, you're fighting for, for decent terms and conditions, but it means you're also fighting for generic services um, for the communities you're serving. Yeah, absolutely. You know. it, always, um, it always annoys me whenever there's tube strikes and I see the way it's reported in the media and there's a lot of... A lot of the times, the, the salaries of the tube strikers, mm. of, of the tube uh, drivers and things, is sort of highlighted as if to say, oh, well, they should be happy that they get this. Mm. And they kind of, um, those in power seem to want to create a sense of resentment mm. between the people who use the tube and the mm. people who actually work on it, when in fact, we'd all, I mean, to use that example of the tube, we'd all benefit from the workers being better paid and better treated because mm. it would mean a better service. Mm. And, you know, things like safety and all that kind of things, it's, we actually would benefit. So it, it is interesting, isn't it, how, um, how actually it's, it, you know, the companies will try and, and, um, and those in power will try and portray it mm. as, 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 as that we're not on the same side, but actually, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And it's really important for us at Grenfell, because housing, there's so many issues around a lack of permanence. I mean, this borough has 3,500 people on its waiting list. Mm -hmm. You know, we know that they are empty properties. Now, if we could work with the housing workers, we could identify that. It would make their job easier. They would feel, at the end of the day, we've been able to contribute, actually, to what's happened at Grenfell, but we've also been able to house people rather than people coming in and shouting at you or crying because they haven't got anywhere to live, etc., etc. We need a united campaign to take on, you know, in, certainly in this borough, and I think it has to be all over the country, um, you know, the deficits in housing where people are just left in the most appalling conditions. You know, I, I read yesterday, I think it was, that Sheffield are housing people in tents. Tents. That's incredible. And like, Yes. So, I mean, you know, unless... And, and who would have done that? Surely that would have been a housing officer somewhere mm -hmm. who should have said, no, we cannot do this. This is, this is in breach of the person's human rights, you know, blah, 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 blah. We breach of our statutory duty to our residents, blah, blah. You know, um, actually, let's find somewhere or let's contact a housing group that may have access or something to know. Because obviously we have inside, no, we live here, we know where the empty properties are. You know, we could tell those, those workers. So I think we need a little bit more, more joint up um, thinking. Mm -hmm. And also because it's become clear to us that in Kensington and Chelsea, certainly, we think, suspect they're in breach of the Equalities, um, the duty of the Equalities Act. And we are challenging them on that in terms of institutional racism, because I think institutional racism has become or has been there, but it's now much, much more obvious. And that's something that we want to take on. You know, how are the how many local um, residents do you employ who know the area you know how many black staff do you have how many you know what are the conditions under which they work because we hear stories from people where they where the black staff are treated awfully you know they're first to be sacked first to actually have complaints disciplines zero hours contract all those kind of poor conditions which really the community is starting to take on, but the union should also be take, working with us to take that yeah. on, really. Of course. How can people support Justice for Grenfell and what you're doing? We have a website at www.justiceforgrenfell.org. Mm -hmm. um, 
We have Instagram account, um, official, official J4G, that's our Twitter. Um, people, if you go onto the website, there you can join as a member, it's free to join. Um, you get updates um, and we have a PayPal if anybody wants to make a contribution, a financial contribution. It's always very welcome to sustain the campaign. Um, you know, if we have any um, marches, come and support. And on the 14th of every month, there's a silent walk that happens in the area and happens in areas right across the country. Usually we advertise where the silent walks are happening in other places like Liverpool, Bristol, you know. So people should go and support that. Yeah, absolutely. I've been on um, a few of those and it's really powerful being on it because it's because it is silent. I think it's really um, mm. yeah. It's, I think that's it. And people can find out about that obviously on, mm. on social media. The next question then is: Is there anything that people can read or watch um, in terms of maybe a book or a film, or it can be anything, <laughs> something that's inspired you or something to learn about more about the issues that we've talked about today? Mm. I think you sometimes get completely and utterly sucked into the issues and sometimes it's really hard to think oh i've got to keep going i've got to keep going and the person that's inspired me most is reading any of angela davis's works because i i do find that actually it's a different historical period but she's very very clear on who is to blame that there's a it's systemic the capitalist system is there but she also is incredibly inspirational her life story is incredibly powerful in particular she talks on race class and women and i think that's a book i would rec certainly recommend excellent that's a really good recommendation um the last question then is how can people get involved uh, more generally how, what do you think people can do um maybe if they're listening to this and they haven't really got involved in activism before what can people be doing to um to fight against some of the issues that we've, we've talked about or to help those who are fighting? I think there's a, lots of different things. In terms of housing, I really do think whether you're a private renter, whether you're in council housing, housing association housing, I think getting organised is really, really important and actually agitating, going to make noise, as you know, writing to your landlord, even if you're setting up petitions, but also supporting, you know, local groups who are fighting against injustice, you know, stand up to racism. There's the question of the Stansted 15 now, which will impact on our right to protest. Um, you know, going into parliament, I mean, at this particular point, I, f I feel that we should take a lead from people in France, you know, don our yellow gilets and actually go out and demand that there's a change that happens at parliamentary level so that the unequal society we live in doesn't continue. Because, you know, the question is always, if not now, when? And if not you, who? You know, no one's going to do it for you. We have to actually get up off our knees. We have to go out there. And we really do have to start challenging the system we live in. Because otherwise, what legacy do we have to leave after this atrocity? And we have to have a legacy of positivity. And it is possible. Future Heist is recorded and produced by me, Rena Neve Smith, with original music by Benjamin Tassi, artwork by Fleur Beck, and sound editing by Jibran Farah. Special thanks to Chloe Vasegi and Joshua Lowe's Challenge. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at future underscore heist. Thank you.